Good afternoon. We are very fortunate today because Renee Van Hoff, and I'm sure you all know who she is, is going to tell us all sorts of things about her profession. I think the first question we should ask her is how she became an interpreter. Do you think you could tell us a little bit about your past, a little bit about your career? Where did it all begin? It started without knowing that I was interpreting because I worked with the Belgian politician, Paul Henri Spark, and I worked with him for UNICEF, so as an administrative secretary. But he only spoke French, and we worked for UNICEF, and we had to raise money all over the world, and he only spoke his own language. So I had to interpret without knowing that I was doing it into English and German and Dutch when we were traveling. And then he said to me, why don't you become an interpreter? Because I like your voice. Most the interpreters have high-pitched voices and I don't like that. So why don't you become an interpreter? What did you do then? Did you go to university? What was the situation like at that time? So that's a good question because I had never studied interpretation. I came out of l'Université Libre de Bruxelles as a licencié en philosophie et lettres. And so he sent me to see Monsieur Caminquer, who was the very famous head of interpretation in the Council of Europe. And he interviewed me, not like the interview today. He said, tell me about theater, about music, in all sorts of languages, wanted to know what my interests were. And then he said, you'll be an interpreter, but you have to learn it. And so I was sent to Geneva, where I did a course of only one month. And that was a very accelerated course. And then I passed the exam to go to the high authority and I started to work with Jean Monnet in the beginning of the high authority. And uh, what were those first years like? What happened? Was the work the same as it is today? I'm referring to meetings, colleagues. Can you describe the situation? It was the same as far as consecutive is concerned. That never changes. Simultaneous was different because the working conditions were absolutely horrible. I was in the same booth with the very famous interpreter Danica Seleskovic, but we couldn't move. I mean, we really gave each other's kicks with our feet and we demolished our stockings. It was so small and nobody cared at that time for conditions of working. People were happy to be allowed to be interpreters and to do simultaneous work in what they called at that time the parliament, not yet parliament, but sort of parliament, high authority, council of ministers and the court of justice, the same institution already existed. Can you tell me a little bit about the kind of people who were working as professional interpreters at that time? That is also very different because we had only four languages, French, German, Dutch, and Italian. And so it was very difficult to find people from Dutch into French. That is why I was recruited, because they needed absolutely somebody who did that. The Germans came from interpreter school, Germersheim and the other one, and most of them had really always been interpreters. The head of the team was a lawyer. He was called Mr. Spira. And he was taking on because before him they had asked somebody to have the service, but who had been an interpreter with Hitler. And so when Jean Monnet crossed the frontier to go to France from Luxembourg with his German colleague, with this interpreter, the interpreter was not allowed to go in because he was on the list of Nazis. And so they had to find somebody and they found this French lawyer called Spira, who then became, without knowing it, the head of the interpretation service, because at least he was from Alsace, he knew French and German. And what about the years following that? What happened next? Can you tell me a little bit about that time and also about everything you've done for the profession? And what about Skik? Can you describe how Skik came about? Well, I was very, first of all, I was very young when I started, and when I was 25, I wanted to get married, and I said to the president of the high authority, I wanted to resign, wanted to go back to Brussels. He said, no, I don't let you go, we need you here. Then I went to the Council of Ministers, and they said, no, we don't let you go, but we sent you to Brussels, because we are starting a new treaty 
we are trying to work on a new treaty for the whole community economic market and whatever and that will take place in Val Duchesse in Brussels and why couldn't you just chair the interpreters who are making up the treaty and so we needed five or six interpreters during that very interesting period until we had the Treaty of Rome and in 58 we started in the Commission and because these interpreters were there for interpreting only French and German, again, no other languages, inside the negotiations for the new treaty. We were taken over then as a common service for all the new institutions and not only the Commission, but the Council and so on and so on. And that is how it started with the German president of the Commission, Hallstein, who stayed there for 10 years. So we had a Hallstein German for 10 years, then some others and again the law for 10 years and the service became much 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 bigger because Hallstein said why don't you start with 10 or 11 well you can imagine what it has become since and what do you think about that so many languages what do you think about the system now when you compare it to the 60s and 70s would you say that the system is working no, I think that the United Nations were very wise. They always stayed with the same number of languages. They have six official languages. And even if Germany has become important, if Japan has become more important, they still have no Japanese, they still have no Portuguese in spite of Brazil and Portugal. They just stayed with their six languages. And if somebody wants to come and speak his own language in the United Nations, he has to come with his interpreter. But they do not change the official languages. We did exactly the opposite. Every new member country and everybody could become in if they are democracy, so Spain joined after dictatorship and Greece joined, all these countries could come in. They all came in with their languages and I was very much opposed to it. I think it's a bad decision and it is one of the obstacles to the European identity because we do not choose one or two languages we would all be able to speak. What's your opinion on the importance of English? Do you believe English is going to be the future? Are people really going to be able to negotiate and uh, I think it is not only the future, it's the present. When people really want to talk to each other, it is in English. Take the present president of the European Council. He is from Poland and when he was chosen, he is called Tusk, he didn't know English. He learned it quickly. He now makes his press conferences in absolutely understandable English because he knows that is the language he has to speak. And when the heads of state meet in, in just two or three of them, it's all in English. This is different from a period when we had Mitterrand, Thatcher and Kohl. Mitterrand only spoke French, Kohl only spoke German and Thatcher only spoke English. So the three of them could not even have a breakfast in the morning without interpreters. That has changed. They don't need an interpreter for breakfast. They can speak all English. Given this situation then, do you think there is a future for interpreters if meetings are held entirely in English? What can we do about this? If interpreters themselves understand that they are only existing if they are useful, if they themselves understand not to go into languages that are disappearing in the future because they are small languages and from countries where everybody speaks English, then we'll always have interpreters for Arabic, for Chinese and into English because that will be the generally understood language. So that means that in the future there will be a big English booth with the languages that you mentioned and perhaps the other booths will become less important? I think so. I think people will still exist who come from a country, who have been chosen into a parliament, only know their own language. You cannot avoid it. There can be always a Bulgarian who can only speak Bulgarian. That will be interpreted into English and people will all have to understand English. That is what you are. There's a big difference between understanding and speaking. And speaking for some people 
need some courage because they have an accent, but understanding they can all learn and it should be the first language in every school in the whole European Union so that they all will, all the new generation will understand English. If a student wanting to be an interpreter were to ask you if you would recommend interpreting as a career, what would you say? Do you think there's a future for young students in interpreting? After all, it's a fascinating career. Interpreters get to travel, they meet interesting people, learn new things. Is there a future for younger generations? I think if somebody wants to be an interpreter, I would give him or her the same advice my mother was given when I wanted to become an interpreter. She went to Geneva to ask people in Geneva, in the institutions, should my daughter become an interpreter? They all said, let her study something else first. And then if she still wants to be an interpreter, let her do a postgraduate course in interpretation, which will not take long if she is an economist or a lawyer. And so study something else first. And if you still want to be an interpreter, do it. Well, thank you very much, Madame Van Hoff. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, and I'm sure that those who follow my blog, Our In Your Ear, will appreciate this interview. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.